Hi friends, this is Riddhi Joshi and today I am going to talk about spine assessment and diagnosis. First of all, we are going to see about the posture. Why we need to learn about the posture for spine? For example, when we are sitting, that time if we are working on the computer, so sometimes we sit with the forward head. So that is not a good posture. So that will create some muscle imbalance in your spine and that will uh, create pain. That's why we need to learn good posture and bad posture. Let's have a look on that. So first of all, what is good posture? Good posture means this diagram is noted as a good posture. It's optimal alignment of body which allows neuromuscular system to perform action needs that least amount of energy to achieve activities in daily life means if you are able to perform daily activities in life uh, with least amount of energy that calls good posture bad posture means non neural alignment of body means if you have muscular imbalance in pelvis or in shoulder or in head so that will create forward head posture kyphosis scoliosis everything it may create that called bad posture so when we are kid that time we just have a primary curve and this is like sacral curve so what do you indicate this this is like this is the thoracic curve and the down one the bottom one is the sacral curve these both are primary curve as we took birth so series of primary curves occur so kyphotic posture to whole spine that is called primary curve secondary curve means child develops an erect posture that calls secondary curve so in secondary curve we have like here we can notice when uh, secondary curve develops that time we have cervical curve and lumbar curve let's see the ideal posture let's see ideal posture so ideal posture we should measure with the help of plumb line so in that we should uh, know that our external auditory meter should be at the level shoulder should be at the level hip should be level knee and ankle should be at level means if you have like uh, both the PSIS should be the same level so when body, body landmarks uh, you need to know that the this plumb line it comes through the external auditory meters is passed to the anterior to the shoulder and through the hip joint and slightly anterior to the knee joint and slightly anterior to the ankle joint so this is your ideal posture let's see what happens if we have different posture first of all we are going to see forward head posture so in this head position is anteriorly we can see that this uh, extra here assume that this is your ear and external auditory meatus so your head is moving a bit forward so head position is anteriorly this increase normal anterior convexity of your head so increase lower cervical spine lordosis and rounded shoulder you can see here this is like rounded shoulder with thoracic kyphosis so what will be the compensation if we do forward head posture repeatedly that will increase compression or force on anterior lower cervical vertebrae so posterior facet joint also affected and the, there will be narrowing of intervertebral foramen uh, in uh, lord, um, foramen so lordotic cervical region and tight anterior and stretched posterior muscle so anterior muscle will be tight and posterior muscle will be stretched so upper cross syndrome will occur in forward head posture so which muscle are weak and which muscle are tight during forward head posture let's see muscles like rhomboids and middle trapezius plus lower trapezius are weak muscles are tight like sternocleidomastoid levator scapulae upper trapezius suboccipital muscles and pectoralis major and minor are tight now we are going to see the lordotic posture this is lordotic posture this is lumbar lordosis posture uh, let's see the definition first the lordotic posture means abnormal increase in normal anterior convexity of either cervical lumbar regions of the vertebral column if it is in cervical so cervical lordosis if it is in lumbar so lumbar lordosis let's have a look on description of lordotic posture our normal pelvis angle is just 30 degree here we can see that here normal pelvis angle is 30 degree it will be like 
30 degree when patient is having lumbar lordosis so it will increase this cause increased shear force on vertebra elongation of anterior longitudinal ligament and compression of lumbar facet that's why we have like uh, narrowing of uh, intervertebral foramen get narrow and uh, like type we can see that uh, in lordotic type uh, we have different types of lordotic posture like cervical lordosis or lumbar lordosis so that time scapula will go for protraction internal rotation of your arms and legs forward head position and uh, that leads to the muscular imbalance what are the cause for this lordotic posture like muscular imbalance uh, if we are lifting heavy weights heavy abdomens means uh, if uh, patient is having bad weight means uh, patient is having more weight they feel lordotic posture if hip flexor contracture is there that time also we uh, have lordotic posture spondylolisthesis or wearing high heel shoes leads to the lordosis so what muscles are weak the abdominal abdominal muscles get weak weak hip extensors tight hip flexors and lumbar extensor are Right. that lead to the anterior tilting of your pelvis let's have a look on that here we can see like your pelvis is tilted anteriorly anterior pelvic tilt hip flexors are tight that pulls your pelvis anteriorly here we can see that like lumbar extensor are tight here can notice like our abdominal abdominal muscle are so here like weak hip extensors so that lead to the anterior tilting of your pelvis now we are going to see kyphosis posture so definition of kyphotic posture there is abnormal increase in the normal posterior convexity of thoracic vertebra there will be pathological exaggeration of normal curve in thoracic spine so what are the cause for that patient might have tuberculosis compression fracture of vertebral column or osteoporosis congenital abnormality or normality this all lead to the kyphosis thoracic kyphosis uh, there will be muscular weakness and muscular tightness so intercostal pectoral is major serratus anterior levator scapulae and upper trapezius are tight and uh, like erector spinae rhomboids and middle and lower trapezius are v that lead to the kyphotic posture now we are going to see swebeck posture so what happens in swebeck posture swebeck posture means decrease lordosis and increase kyphosis so here there will be in, uh, normally our pelvic angle is 30 degree so it will increase up to 40 degree that lead to thoracic kyphosis and spine bending so spine will uh, bending instead of straight lumbosacral angle so causes will be the same as a lumbar lordosis so what happens in sway back posture for muscles so some muscle get weak some muscle get tight so lower abdominal muscles are for example these are the abdominal muscles and here we can see that the tight hip extensors lower lumbar extensors are tight and internal intercostals are Tight. some muscles like uh, weak hip flexors and lower abdominal muscles are weak instead of internal obliques are strong so when our uh, hip flexors are weak that lead to the posterior tilting of pelvis because here tight hip extensors that will pull your pelvis back side so compensation like por posterior pelvic tilt hip moves into the extension in order to maintain the cog in normal spine flexion on lumbar and thoracic curve that leads to the muscular imbalance now we are going to see the flat back posture let's see the definition there will be decreased pelvic inclination up to 20 degree normal is 30 so pelvic inclination from here it will be decreased up to 20 degree and mobile lumbar spine means decreased kyphosis and scoliosis here we can notice decreased kyphosis and scoliosis there will be uh, muscular weakness and tightness so what will happen in hip muscles so our hip 
flexors are weak and that like here we can see that hip flexors are weak and flat mid thorax and lumbar and back extensors are also weak here our abdominal muscles are stronger and uh, tightening of hip extensor so that will lead to the uh, posterior tilting of your pelvis because hip uh, extensors are tight and hip flexors are V leads to muscle imbalance and compression of posterior hip joint and anterior lumbar spine and posterior to the thoracic spine. Causes are same as kyphosis. Now we are going to see round back posture. In this diagram we can notice that this is round back posture. It is long round curve with decreased inclination of the pelvis up by 30 degree. Normal angle is 30 degree but that will be decreased. So patient presentation with forward head and decreased lumbar curve. There will be uh, muscle weakness and tightness. So hip flexors are weak, lumbar extensors are weak, hip extensors are tight and trunk flexors are tight. Causes for round back is same as our lumbar lordosis. Now we are going to see doggers and humpback or gibbous posture. So let's have a look for description. Doggers we can only notice in older women. Most of the cause is like osteoporosis will be there. So thoracic vertebra will degenerate and there will be wedge fracture in the anterior direction of the vertebra that leads to the kyphosis. Usually we can notice this in upper and middle thoracic spine. And now we are going to see the humpback posture or gibbous. So what is the humpback posture or gibbous? In gibbous we can notice that this will be like this is patient's so from here neck this will like a gibbous sharp posterior angulation of your thoracic spine called gibbous a structural kyphotic deformity come from anterior waging of body of one or two thoracic vertebra the waging may cause by fracture tumor or bone disease and dogger some the posture will look like patient's head will go for forward and this is like this um, but from here it will be like this but from neck more angulation of your spine decrease lumbar lordosis it will be like this now we are going to see the scoliosis there are different type of scoliosis scoliosis means lateral curvature of your spine it may be congenital idiopathic degenerative neuromuscular some muscles get shortened some muscle get weak so which muscle get shortened so muscles on concave side will get shortened hip abductor are shortened foot goes into supinator for short side and uh, muscles are weak so so muscles in convex side muscle in convex side will be weak hip abductors are weak and pronation of your feet so how we can screen this scoliosis so uh, we can uh, screen this scoliosis in the school because if the girls or boys are under age of 9 to 11 years that time uh, we have to notice this so it is more common in girls than the boys common age is 9 to 11 years for screening so in school they can scre screen for the scoliosis for uh, age of 10 to 12 means if the child is in 5th to 7th grade as uh, this uh, scoliosis screening should start and at the age of uh, 13 to 14 this is the last age for scoliosis screening we can notice in grade 8 or 9 in this we can notice that the shoulder height is different hip cage is uneven we can notice here hip height is also different so it is more prominent on one side entire body leans to one side now we are going to see history of scoliosis. In history we have to ask that patient is having pain or not. If patient is having pain present so he may complain like if he is walking a lot or he is doing daily activity till that time he is feeling more fatigued. He is having difficulty in activity in daily living like wearing clothes, difficulty in prolonged sitting, walking or standing. So as a physical therapist what we will notice in this patient so for example if this is a patient for you guys this is a patient if he is having right side scoliosis so right side this is left side this is his hand this is and the legs so what happens if 
patient is having right side scoliosis so that for that patient right shoulder will be high and left shoulder will be low and the pelvis will be depressed on affected side means right side and elevated means high on left side so if this is like right sided scoliosis for this patient a rib hump noted on the convex side this is a convex side for patient so rib hump is noted impaired pulmonary function so in this patient we can notice that his force vital capacity is decreased his uh, force expiratory volume in one second it might be normal or increased risk come under restrictive lung disease patient may have leg length discrepancy due to scoliosis because right side uh, example we have seen so that patient may have le uh, leg length discrepancy right side is pressed and left side is high and weak gluteus uh, medius on dominant side patient is having a weak gluteus medius on dominant side if patient is having c shape curve so shoulder is low and hip is high on affected side but s shape curve is there so shoulder and hip are high on affected side now we are going to see the x ray so x for x ray we can use the cobbs method this is the cobbs method in this we can see that for example if we have drawn this here like this is the scoliotic scoliosis curve so this is like most most tilted vertebra above the apex this is tilted vertebra vertebra below apex so we draw this two line from this we are drawing a one perpendicular line here both the side and this will be your cobbs angle so in x-ray we can notice this if the scoliosis is a present so if it is less than 40 degree so we can manage it conservatively but it is better than 40 then patient may need surgery if it is 30 to 40 patient need a spinal bracing 30 to 40 sorry for here it's a 40 for this patient we can ask forward bending test so uh, we have to ask patient just uh, bend forward so if it is uh, the scoliosis is not present so it may be non-structural but if it is present so then it will be structural scoliosis so special test forward bending test we can use so how we can diagnose uh, the scoliosis let's see the patient might have functional neuromuscular or degenerative scoliosis let's differentiate that if the patient is having functional that is called non-structural scoliosis patient is having limb, limb length discrepancy and then uh, patient is bending forward that time it disappears if he is uh, lying down and bending that time if it is remained that called structural scoliosis it may due to uh, developmental abnormalities like cerebral palsy marsomaphon syndrome and degenerative also come under structural scoliosis it occurs due to normal aging process disc herniation and osteophyte formation this all are about structural and functional scoliosis and scoliosis diagnosis now we are going to see cervical spine differential diagnosis and assessment so in cervical spine differential diagnosis we have different conditions like cervical stenosis cervical spondylosis torticollis etc so we first of all we are going to see torticollis so what is torticollis it's a symptom occur in 5 to 10 years children mechanism of injury it may be congenital or cervical pharyngitis so patient will we can see in this diagram same side flexion and his uh, head is rotated to opposite side so this is called torticollis sign and symptoms appear at the age of 6 to 8 weeks same sign bending and opposite side rotation we can uh, notice firmness swelling uh, if it is there so it is non tender swelling patient may hold head in position for comfort over the affected side now let's have a look for cervical strain and sprain strain means muscular strain 
and ligamental sprain so what happen in strain and sprain so what are the common uh, age conditions for this cervical strain and sprain or cervical sprain the age is not specified A mechanism of injury for sprain it may be like uh, prolonged static positioning or trauma or forward head position uh, let's have a look for sign and symptoms of cervical sprain in cervical sprain patient is having localized pain tender on touch myofascial trigger point in cervical shoulder or scapular region there will be decreased cervical range of motion and stiff on activities we may notice forward head posture and that cause a pain in cervical region and he may feel headache we can uh, diagnose this with uh, lr ligament testing and normal dtr will be there normal deep tendon reflexes if we are looking for the x ray we cannot see in the x ray uh, the cervical strain it is common in 20 to 40 age group the mechanism of uh, injury like a single traumatic event or cumulative trauma patient may have overweight deconditioning or faulty posture Let's have a look for sign and symptoms of cervical strain. Patient is having pain with contraction or stretching, pain while prolonged sitting, standing, walking. He may have a protective muscle guarding. Patient feel tender on touch. Pertinent finding is decreased contralateral side bending and rotation means active range of motion is a uh, less than passive range of motion so if patient is having less than active range of motion for rotation then we can notice that he is having cervical strain for diagnosis we have to check for vertebral artery test so a patient may have like a vertebral basilar insufficiency for so we have to rule out that with special test patient may have a uh, normal deep tendon reflexes we cannot see the cervical strain in x ray so x ray will be negative Let's look for cervical facet joint syndrome. So when we are thinking for cervical facet joint syndrome, we have to keep in mind for cervical stenosis also. We can differentially diagnose these two two conditions. So when the patient is having facet joint syndrome, that time they have abnormal movement in meniscoid or fibroid. Patient is doing extension, so the meniscoid is not able to re-enter in joint cavity and bunch ups. therefore it becomes space occupying lesion which distended the capsule and that cause pain for patient so if the patient is doing backward bending means extension so that time meniscus is not able to re enter if patient is having isolated cumulative trauma degenerative joint disease aging postural imbalance that may lead to cervical facet joint syndrome therefore the cervical space uh, facet joint syndrome there is no specific age onset may be sudden signs and symptoms like patient uh, is feeling pain in hyperextension and rotation of cervical spine as we have seen earlier in mechanism of injury meniscus is not reentering and it bunch ups which cause space occupying lesion that cause pain how we can diagnose this syndrome we have to see combined movement showing closing pattern restriction like uh, we have to check for extension and rotation magnetic resonance imaging and ct scan are not remarkable for facet joint syndrome so we have to diagnose only from the uh, help of joint syndrome sign and symptoms the special test is used for this is quadrant test let's see cervical stenosis so in cervical stenosis there will be congenital narrowing of spinal canal or intervertebral foramen hypertrophy of ligamentum flavum degenerative joint disease is there mostly male are more affected than female especially the age group is 30 to 60 years onset is gradual gradually there will be narrowing in intervertebral foramen what are the signs and symptoms of stenosis pain decrease with spine flexion and increase with extension when patient is doing extension that time this foramen become narrow and if it is doing flexion so it will open and release the pressure patient has decreased hand dexterity lower motor neuron at the level and upper motor neuron below the level of lesion aggravating factor like walking 
if patient is walking more that time patient is uh, having this kind of symptoms relieved by rest we can confirm stenosis with the help of mri or ct scan if we are looking for the x ray uh, spondylitic changes will be there osteophyte formation is there ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament and ligamentum flavum special test is used for lumbar region is pan glander's test for differential diagnosis with intermittent claudication for spondylosis cervical spondylosis also known as end stage joint disease mechanism of injury mainly a postural imbalance osseous and fibrotic changes that lead to the narrowing of foramen if foramen is narrowed so your nerve is affected now compression will be there and leads to the myelopathy and stenosis most commonly in cervical region c5 c6 and c6 c7 region is affected especially the age group like 30 to 60 years of the people they are more prone for spondylosis let's look for sign and symptoms increase pain with activity and stiffness at rest these are the pertinent finding for spondylosis limited active range of motion and passive range of motion because patient is having muscular enrollment posture and limb balance so active range of motion is limited repetus is present positive compression and distraction test Spe special test like quadrant test we can use for this and uh, if we are looking for the x-ray decrease disc height on x-ray let's see cervical disc pathology mechanism of injury mostly repetitive strains or stress injury poor muscular uh, balance is there especially c5 and c6 is mostly affected age group like 30 to 50 years sign and symptoms like cervical side bending and cervical rotation is less than 60 degree even forward bending is less than 50 degree we can notice sensory changes and dermatomal pattern how we can diagnose this this cervical disc pathology we can uh, go for mri ct scan uh, to you differentiate the nucleus pulposus from annulus fibrosis let's see disc herniation here in this uh, lumbar vertebra we can see that uh, we have a herniated disc this is posterolateral disc herniation which may impinge the nerve the disc herniation it may be posterolateral or central bulge when it is central it is in cervical region when it is posterolateral it is in lumbar region the most common age for posterolateral disc bulge is 30 to 50 years so pathology it's like common in lumbar lumbar spine here in this diagram we can see this like this is posterolateral disc bulges there so which may impinge our nerve spinal cord so patient is having narrow height than anterior posterior longitudinal ligament is very weak in lumbar spine that's why uh, this posterolateral bulge is very common in lumbar spine there may be re repetitive trauma or tear or stretch annulus ring here we can see that tearing of annulus ring or sometime if it is uh, very less so there will be stretching of this ring pain may increase with ipsilateral now root and decrease with contralateral list what are the signs and symptoms for posterolateral disc bulge so patient may feel pain paresthesia radicular pain activity in daily living like uh, bending is uh, painful sometime uh, prolonged sitting it may aggravate the pain low back pain is the first sign uh, for this diagnosis this pain is increased with disc pressure special test is straight leg uh, leg raising test is positive for this patient pain uh, with sneezing or coughing this is the pertinent finding for posterolateral disc bulge we can see this in mri or ct scan for diagnostic purpose let's have a look for central bulge so central bulge is common in cervical spine age is not specified for this central bulge posterior longitudinal ligament uh, having high compressive force and overstretch or tear annulus ring or end plate of vertebra is affected so that is very com um, uh, common mechanism of injury in central bulge this is central bulge in cervical vertebra what are the signs and symptoms for central bulge pain paresthesia radicular pain and activity in daily living is uh, very painful for this patient 
Paresthesia is also common for this patient during activity in daily life, living like patient is working on computer so at that time he might have forwarded posture and uh, that time if he is having uh, this kind of the problem so he may feel uh, severe pain in his shoulder region also. Compression of the spinal cord, CNS symptoms like hyperreflexia and positive waving uh, sign may be noted because it directly compress your spinal cord. Patient, we can notice uh, the diagnosis uh, central bulge in the MRI or CT scan. Let's have a look for whiplash injury. It called acceleration or deceleration injury. In this diagram, we can see that if the patient is having direct impact from front side, so hyperextension injury. If patient is having direct impact from back side, so he may have hyperflexion injury. So it may turn the anterior longitudinal ligament or ligamentum nuque. If a patient is having different kind of injury, they have different kind of symptoms. Let's have a look for mechanism of injury, excessive shear or tensile stress on cervical vertebrae that may lead to the facet joint involvement of ligaments, especially the fracture, push or pull of arm is there, motor vehicle accident is there, fall on shoulder is very common for this kind of injury. If patient is having heavy sports injury, that may have a whiplash injury. Let's see early signs and symptoms for whiplash injury. Patient might have headache, neck pain, limited flexibility, decreased cervical kyphosis, hearing and vision changes. If patient is feeling hearing vision changes, so notice that these are the early signs and symptoms with headache and neck pain and limited flexibility of your cervical spine that means patient might have whiplash injury. Patient may have vertigo, dysesthesia in bilateral upper extremity, swallowing, difficulty on emotional lability is also pertinent finding for early symptoms. Most injury are combined uh, motion like extension and rotation. Patient feels uh, symptoms up to 2 years. What are the late signs and symptoms? If patient is having late sign and symptoms, check for the UMN sign. If patient is having fracture of dance, patient doesn't move neck and uh, painful traction and compression, especially muscle spasm is noted. Patient may complain the sinus problem and symptoms starts within few hours of injury. If patient is having late symptoms, chronic complaint of headache and neck plus shoulder pain. Patient may guard the muscle and hypomobility is noted. Restricted motion is there and it's in segmental pattern. How we can diagnose this whiplash injury? We have to diagnose from neurological signs and symptoms like early symptoms, late symptoms, UMN signs, fracture signs. If the patient is having CT or MRI, they only show age related changes. A plain print x ray for fracture, but it is not remarkable for whiplash injury so we have to just check neurological signs and symptoms for a diagnostic feature let's see burner or stinger injury it also known as brachial plexopathy let's see mechanism of injury for this stretching compression of cervical spine or forceful depression of your shoulder that may lead to burner or stinger injury especially c5 c6 nerve root are affected some sports like football players they are more prone to injury for burner or stinger injury it also noticed in wrestlers gymnastics and uh, hockey players sign and symptoms like sharp burning in upper extremity numbness and needle pain in upper extremity decreased deep tendon reflexes muscular weakness myelogram is helpful for diagnosis special test like ipsilateral side bending and contralateral stretch plus compression diagnose this burner and stringer injury here we can see the type of burner and stringer injury first type is stretched brachial plexus in this diagram we can notice that this is let's see this is brachial plexus so it is stretched so patient have traction injury when a patient is having depressed shoulder and neck is forced into the lateral flexion away from the involved side that result into the stretching of brachial plexus second is direct blow here this will be like direct blow on brachial plexus so direct blow on supraclavicular fossa lead to percussive injury of upper trunk 
and the third injury it is with now compression by combination of hyperextension and ipsilateral flexion this is the second head is hyperextension and this is ipsilateral bending so here there will be the lesion now compression by same side flexion and extension so most persistent and severe symptoms of burner injury is noted in this kind of injury especially patient is uh, doing same side flexion and hyperextension so that time they have severe problem now we are going to see thoracic spine differential diagnosis first is rib fracture this is we can notice like so these are all rib fractures so that might be due to direct blow or coffin frail person sign and symptoms like pain in deep inspiration x-ray difficult to assess immediately after the injury test like epilateral at means anteroposterior and lateral rib compression test is positive second is costro chondritis so in costro chondritis patient might have trauma infection surgery or arthritis so in costro chondritis let's assume this is manibrum sterni so here the ribs are going so patient is having pain this side this is costochondral junction so this side patient is having pain this is mostly common on the left side of extremity i mean left side of the ribs this is right side this is left so costochondritis is most common on left side the patient is having localized pain in anterior chest wall tender to touch increase uh, pain with coughing and may irradiate to upper extremity let's see compression fracture so compression fracture of a thoracic spine we can notice like here it's a compression fracture of t12 so this is like this red mark you can see this this is the compression fracture of t11 12 vertebra so it is common in t11 12 trauma osteoporosis lead to the compression fracture sign and symptoms like acute pain with adjacent muscle guarding limited backward bending means limited extension and rotation x ray is a diagnostic feature so it is positive in x ray let's have a look for lumbar spine differential diagnosis first is internal disc disruption mechanism of injury like external trauma is there or common in lumbar region internal disc is also uh, disrupted sign and symptoms patient is having a deep achy pain increase with the movement it may refer to the lower extremity without any neurological involvement diagnosis ct scan my, uh, myelogram is not demonstrate any abnormalities it is confirmed with mri or discogram because it is internal disc disruption so we have to go for mri or discogram now we are going to see ankylosing spondylitis it is also known as stumpel mary disease it is common in male and then female age is 15 to 14 years mostly pathology it includes anterior longitudinal ligament and patient may have a disc ossification in thoracic sacrobofacial joint mean thoracic facial joint ossification is there so sign and symptoms like patient may have forward head posture hyperextended cervical spine thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis hip and knee flexion contracture is there patient may feel pain at night time and their expansion is decreased so we have to ask them some five screening questions let's see that patient first of all if patient is coming to you then uh, for screening question you have to ask they have morning stiffness or not so if they have morning stiffness it is greater than 30 minutes so if that indicates uh, ankylosing spondylitis do uh, does your condition improve with exercise means if patient condition is improving with exercise for example uh, if they are doing rib expansion exercise or breathing exercise uh, so that may improve their breathing pattern do they have onset of back pain before age of 40 years because uh, the age of onset is 15 to 40 years does the onset was slow or gradual so if it is slow then it may indicate ankylosing spondylitis if their symptoms was greater than 3 months that will definitely indicate they have ankylosing spondylitis 
series so these are one two three four and five question if the four question are right then increase correlation with ankylosing spondylitis we may diagnose ankylosing spondylitis with lab tests like hlab 27 and specially clinical examination like we have to ch check their chest expansion we have to check onset we have to check their knee flexion contracture they have other postural abnormalities uh, thoracic uh, kyphosis lumbar lordosis etc that they, they are available so we can screen with the help of clinical examination let's see lumbar spondylosis or arthrosis it is common in age of 60s onset is slow mechanism of injury like degenerative joint, uh, joint disease is there it affects l45 region in lumbar area and cervical c5 c6 and c7 area sign and symptoms like pain is unilaterally especially with prolonged posture we can notice this pain pain increase with extension decrease with flexion pain is especially there if a patient is feeling stiff on rising pain is with morning four to five hours especially increase pain in bending if patient is bending backward that time he is having pain constant pain awareness and exacerbation is there Characteristic of pain is like patient is having nagging pain or sore pain. So with the help of these features, we can diagnose that patient is having spondylosis. X-ray can confirm the diagnosis. Decreased joint space is noted and narrowing of intervertebral foramen. Now we are going to see spondylolysis. So it is important to remember spondylosis, spondylolysis, spondylolysthesis. So now we are learning spondylolysis. So spondylolysis is traumatic pars fracture due to repeated sustained extension. It happens in skiing, jumping, gymnastic. It may be structural problem. Sign and symptoms like patient is doing extension or hyperextension of spine. So that time he may feel pain. Especially this is intermittent neurological sign we can notice because it may compress a different nerve roots. X-ray oblique view we can show see the pars interarticularis fracture without slippage like scotty dog with a collar in this diagram i'll show you scotty dog with collar this is collar and this is like scotty dog so spondylolysis we can notice in oblique view now we are going to see spondylolysthesis Spondylolysthesis, here we can notice that this L5 vertebra will slip over S1. Vertebral subluxation is mechanism of injury. It may be second degree slippage, anterior or posterior slipping of vertebra on other, followed by bilateral fracture of pars in the articularis. There will be long history of lumbar trauma. Like vitrolysthesis is not equal common but present with flexion symptoms. Special test like stock standing test is helpful for diagnostic of spondylolysthesis. X-ray like lateral view for slippage we can notice. This is like let, uh, in lateral view we can see this uh, L5 over S1 slippage. Uh, so always remember that for spondylolysthesis we use lateral view but for uh, spondylolysis we use lysis its oblique view now we are going to learn lumbar stenosis it is common in male than female especially at the age of 50 stenosis is most common onset is insidious mechanism of injury narrowing of spinal canal which may affect the spinal nerves patient is having dull ache so sign and symptoms like dull aching pain in lumbar spine region increased pain while walking uphill walking knee to chest activities sitting flexion pillow under knees this all activity will increase pain pain is located on thigh and buttock region so that time we need to see upper motor neuron sign like ataxia hyperreflexia below the level of lesion this is the below the level of lesion and element sign at the level of lesion so nocturnal pain and cramp cramping is there for lumbar stenosis diagnosis, X-ray we can only see osteophyte. CT scan shows encouragement of spinal canal and MRI can only confirm the diagnosis. Special test, a negative straight leg resin test and negative femoral nerve test. 
now we are going to see lumbar facet joint syndrome so it is uh, due to mechanical cumulative trauma degenerative uh, disc disease and postural problem pain is especially referred to the gluteal region and thigh region morning pain primarily with the compression pain decrease with flexion and increase with extension patient may feel stiff on rising and is within hour pain increase with sharply certain movement if patient is suddenly extending her uh, back so that time she may felt a uh, sharp increase in pain pain free range like that may decrease the symptoms stationary position increase the sp uh, symptoms of pain pain increase with ipsilateral side bending and rotation x ray we can only see osteophyte formation test stock standing test is positive this is special test used for diagnosis of uh, facet joint syndrome nerve root problem if the patient is having nerve root problem so no pain in recline or semi recline position only patient is having shooting burning stabbing type of pain so that may increase with weight bearing activities patient is having osteoporosis so let's see that osteoporosis means reduction of bone mass mechanism of injury like insufficient formation or excessive resorption of bone means osteoblast activity and osteoclastic activity so osteoblast means make a new material and osteoblast means breakdown of bone so if there is insufficient formation of bone or excessive resorption of bone that may lead to osteoporosis trauma inflammation and stenosis even tumor are mechanic mechanism of injury for osteoporosis signs and symptoms like dogger's hump we can notice loss of bone height approximately 2 to 4 cm acute low back pain in thorax and lumbar area if we see the x ray they can only show the fracture bone scan confirm with bone scan this is typing mistake just bone scan scan confirm diagnosis for osteoporosis let's see vascular and neurological claudication differential diagnosis so if the patient is having vascular claudication so they, it is common in age of 40 it is pain location like hip buttock thigh region and calf region patient may describe pain as a cramping squeezing and aching numbness is present and absent of pulse position and response of patient pain present in all position especially activities like uphill walking physical activity exertion may increase the pain and relieved by rest there is no sensory or burning change changes in vascular claudication skin changes and pulse there will be decreased pulse or absent pulse and, and color changes we can notice in vascular claudication if patient is having neurological claudication age is not specified it is located in unilateral or bilateral especially in lower back and buttock description patient is uh, describing tingling burning and weakness plus numbness position and response of the patient decrease pain with flexion and increase pain in extension activities like walking increase the pain and recumbency decrease the pain sensation changes like burning and numbness in lower extremity is noted in neurological claudication there won't be any uh, skin changes or pulse changes in neurological claudication now we are going to see sacroiliac joint problem so mechanism of injury like inflammation degenerative joint disease or abnormal muscles means muscle imbalance is there so it is diagnosed diagnosed with the help of mri for sacroiliac joint gillette test is used to assess innominate mobility ipsilateral anterior rotation test that is uh, that used for assessment of ilium in relation to sacrum genslens test for uh, sacroiliac pathology supine to sit test for position of ilium and golvet test for uh, lumbar spine and sacroiliac joint differential diagnosis gapping and distraction assess the si means sacroiliac joint pathology so this all test we have to remember for sacroiliac joint pathology now we are going to see nutation so what is nutation nutation means 
sacrum is forward in relation to pelvis so this is your sacral bone if it is in forward in relation to pelvic bone that is known as nutation so what happens to your lumbar spine and innominate bone when nutation occurs so that time in this diagram we can see that if sacrum is going for flexion so your lumbar spine here if your lumbar spine is there it will go for extension here it is going for extension and that time your pelvic is moving a bit apart and that's why your innominate will move posteriorly so that's why this is called as nutation now we are going to learn counter nutation counter nutation means sacrum is backward in relation to pelvis sacrum is going for extension here we can notice this is your sacrum if it is going in extension assume this is your sacral bone so if it is going this way downward in extension that is known as counter nutation so what happened to your lumbar spine so if sacrum is moving posteriorly earlier it was going anteriorly now it is moving posteriorly this way going back so if sacrum is moving into extension so that time your lumbar spine will go for flexion and your innominate will come a bit together means closer so anteriorly here your innominate will move a bit anteriorly sacrum move and in extension and lumbar spine will go for flexion let's have a quick look for lumbar motion innominate motion and sacral motion so if your counter nutation is occurring so that time your lumbar will go for flexion innominate anterior rotation if nutation lumbar will go for extension innominate posterior rotation if lumbar is going for rotation if this is lumbar vertebra if it is rotating so that time innominate ipsilaterally posteriorly rotate and this is contralaterally anterior rotation and the sacrum ipsilaterally nutate and for side bending if patient is bending this is patient is standing then if he is bending sideways from here so that time your innominate will this is your hip bone so that will bend anterior rotation and contralaterally it goes posterior rotation same way for sacral motion your sacrum ipsilaterally side bend and contra contralaterally side bend let's see pelvic tilt first of all we are going to see anterior pelvic tilt what happens in anterior pelvic tilt so when there is anterior pelvic tilt at that time some muscles are tight and some are weak so which muscles are tight this iliopsoas psoas and iliacus collectively known as iliopsoas so iliopsoas your erector spinae tensor fasciae lata and rectus femoris are tight in contrary to this here like your gluteal muscle glutes your hamstring hamstring your like here there will be rectus abdominis and like external oblique these muscles are weak so like this way for example your erector spinae your hip flexors your hip extensors and your abdominals so for example here your hip flexors and erector spinae are tight so your hip flexors they are pulling your this is your hip so they are pulling it down that's why anterior pelvic tilt occur because your hip extensors they are not working properly so they are not able to maintain the hip in proper position your abdominals are also weak that's why your anterior pelvic tilt will occur now posterior pelvic tilt so in posterior pelvic tilt your rectus abdominis external oblique gluteus maximus and hamstring are tight so if this all muscle are tight these are tight your gluteus maximus hams external oblique and abdominal are tight and hip flexors 
and here your erector spiny so here your erector spiny and here your hip flexors are weak so if your hip flexors are weak they won't able to stabilize your hip that's why your hip is moving posteriorly and posterior tilt of pelvis will occur so these are all about posterior and anterior pelvic tilt